Well, it's an enormous pleasure and privilege to be here. Um, and let me thank the organizers um, wholeheartedly for, for inviting me. And, and let me perhaps say as a, take the privilege of a, of a guest and visitor to say that, uh, you know, I've studied Kant for, for many, you know, since my undergraduate days and I've, I think I've dreamed of seeing Königsberg, Kaliningrad all this time. And to be here on the, on the, on the banks of the, the Pregelflusa in a city that, again, speaking with the privilege of a guest, seems so, on the one hand, haunted by, by tragic memories, by ghosts, um, and on the other hand, pregnant with, with hopeful possibilities. Um, it's, a, it's a particularly poignant experience for me, and it must be for you every, every day, uh, especially here between the bust, uh, the statue of Immanuel Kant and the old bunker of the Wehrmacht. I mean, it's, 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 it, it puts in perspective, uh, I think, Kant's uh, note in his late anthropology uh, in which he comments on his felic his, his, the felicitous good fortune of, of being born in, and raised in, in Königsberg from the standpoint of the cultivation of, of the human spirit. And I think, I think that's, that remains the case um, emphatically. Um, I'd also like to say it's, it's sort of serendipitous to, uh, to, to be here after the, the two previous papers, um, pr inspiring and provocative, and perhaps this will be a kind of you know, trilogy, <laughs> because my, my themes will, will, will in a way touch on the ones that we've, we've, we've already been discussing this morning. Um, and at least as I will present the mature Kant, the Kant's mature political views, um, he is neither a quasi hobbist nor uh, an anarcho-socialist, um, but, but a practitioner of what he calls the true politics. And I try to explain a bit what, what I think that, what that means to him. Mm -hmm. Kant's political thought has recently emerged as a topic of major scholarly concern after many years of general neglect, especially in the English-speaking world. Thanks to the seminal work of scholars such as Patrick Riley, Howard Williams, and above all, John Rawls, whose path-breaking work set in motion a virtual industry of scholarship along constructivist lines. More recent work has focused not only on the strengths and limitations of this approach, but also on alternative reconstructive readings, as well as including philosophically sophisticated textual studies that pay nuanced attention to the intellectual and historical context. And I have in mind here particularly the work of Pauline Kleingeld, who is happily with us, um, uh, writer Malix and others. Much of the research that has flourished in the most recent years has clustered around particular themes, um, while other work has addressed with new vigor the place of history and politics in Kant's overall scheme. And it's impossible to do justice this morning, or I guess it's, is it still the morning, almost the afternoon, to these and other recent contributions to our understanding of Kant's later political and historical thought, and even less to the many controversies this work has generated. Instead, I'd like to view Kant's late approach to politics through a somewhat narrower and still largely neglected lens, namely Kant's own use of the term politics, politique, both generally and in later years as a term of art. Kant's understanding of politics in the latter sense sheds revealing light, I'll argue, not only on his late conception of republicanism and accompanying two-tiered strategy, um, uh, for bending the arc of history toward the better, but also on the evolving role of politics within Kant's overall critical system. So first, uh, Kant's pre-revolutionary politics. Prior to the French Revolution, Kant used the term politics only rarely and in either a broadly descriptive sense, as in political geography, or even more uncommonly in the then con conventional sense of prudence in affairs of state, Stotz Klugheit. Thanks to the pervasive influence of Machiavelli and his followers, the ordinary meaning of politics had by the 18th century changed from the high-minded concern of the wise and virtuous statesmen, as in Aristotle's politics, to an explicitly amoral reason of state, and by extension, the self-serving manipulation of others, 
to enhance one's own power, wealth, and glory. This transformation is anticipated in the famous paragraph of Machiavelli's Prince, which calls upon rulers to take their bearings from how men live rather than how they ought to live. Frederick II's own anti-Machiavel, co-authored with Voltaire and published in 1740, I think testifies to the ongoing salience of politics in this new broadly Machiavellian sense, both as a target for moral and religious opprobrium and as a secret model for emulation. Under the reign of Frederick II, 1740 to 1786, Kant devoted little thematic attention to politics, a term that is especially uncommon in his writings of the 1780s. At the same time, he did not hesitate to make use of politics in a roughly Machiavellian sense by appealing to the self-interest of enlightened rulers like Frederick II to promote the enlightenment cause. Rulers could be better served, and, and uh, uh, Pauline Klanglad, you know, already already mentioned this this aspect of Kant's earlier teaching. Um, could uh, rulers could. Um, best serve their own interests, Kant argued, as well as promote the aim of enlightenment more generally by permitting the free public use of reason without relinquishing absolute sovereignty, by thus guarding the state against um, the potentially destabilizing effects of free public discourse, especially in matters of religion, absolutism was more favorable to the transformation of a people's Denkungsart, way of thinking, or so Kant famously urged in What is Enlightenment, than could be assured under the a regime in which people enjoyed greater civil freedom. Such an approach represented a secure path to genuine patriotic government, as he calls it, uh, down the road than a premature expansion of political rights at the expense of civil order. A perfectly just constitution, as Kant wrote in the same year, is, quote, a society in which freedom under external laws can be encountered combined in the greatest possible degree with irresistible power, unquote. A definition broadly in line with the principles of Hobbes, so long as lawful freedom replaces mutual survival as the primary goal of civil peace. To be sure, such a society would constitute more than, no more than a glittering misery, as Kant puts it, did that civic arrangement not also promise to contribute to a moralization, as he puts it, of the human race by allowing all the predispositions of humanity to de develop freely and without mutual hindrance? Still, uh, now that the idea of universal history from a cosmopolitan standpoint had been announced, at least provisionally, future progress toward that civil and moral end, as here presented, was, if not assured, at least on track. Two further qualifications limit Kant's Hobbesianism from the start. First, sovereignty is ideally vested in the people. At the same time, the people actually exist only insofar as they are represented by a supreme commander whose will is irresistible. Second, like, unlike Hobbes, Kant insists on a distinction between monarchy and tyranny, albeit one that is strictly unenforceable. Now, given his appraisal of the situation under Frederick the Great, it is unsurprising then that Kant devoted little thematic attention during most of the 1780s to politics as such. Frederick's 1785 motto, argue as much as you like, only obey, was ultimately to be vindicated by and through the critical instruction whose ever wider dissemination Kant had good reason to expect, not least because it coincided with the self-interest of enlightened rulers or you know, quote unquote, enlightened rulers like Frederick II, rulers wishing that is to secure not only obedient subjects, but also a prosperous state and their own future glory. Left to their own selfish devices, autocratic rulers could be counted on to advance the cause of progress more effectively and with less civil danger than would be otherwise be possible thanks to nature's cultivation thereby of, quote, mankind's propensity to think freely, unquote. The Machiavellian challenge could be met, in other words, by Machiavellian means as partly reinterpreted by Hobbes and as placed in service to a broadly Rousseauian ideal and accompanying moral aim, namely, quote, a people capable of freedom in acting, unquote. Two. 
Kant's pre-revolutionary republicanism. Prior to 1789, Kant's republicanism can be summarized then by a crude but pithy formula. Broadly Hobbesian means in the service of a broadly Rousseauian principle of civic freedom. As early as the remarks and observations on the beautiful and the sublime, 1765, Kant had identified two civic ideals, republics, which required civic virtue and simplicity of manners, and monarchies, which were suited to luxurious times like the present. Republics offered, quote, equality, freedom, unquote, whereas monarchies, or what he here calls the sovereign state, offer, quote, unity, but not equality, unquote. The, quote, perfect republic, unquote, according to these same notes, is, quote, a combination of equality and unity, a formulation that leaves open the question of whether civic unity can be sustained in modern times without monarchy of some kind, pace Rousseau. In subsequent years, Kant will combine these ideals in a model of justice in which reciprocal freedom is secured by the irresistible will of an enlightened ruler. Such a ruler can be conceived as effectually sovereign insofar as it, quote, represents the people in the specific sense of governing in accordance with laws to which people could consent without giving up their claim to equal freedom under law. The crucial question is thus not who rules, but whether the way of ruling, Regierungsart, conforms to what a rational people in the above sense could conceivably will, and it accords therefore no special value to democracy or to citizens' active participation in positive lawmaking over other constitutional forms. Now, civic freedom and equality, as Rousseau had seen matters, required the passionate identification of citizens with the wider community. Hence, his notorious pessimism concerning the possibility of reconciling civic health with progress in the arts and sciences. Now, for all his praise of Rousseau's genius, Kant never shared in that pessimism. Even in the remarks, Kant had sought to reconcile progress in the arts and sciences with civic health by prioritizing universal and hence ra a rational form of the general will over its particular content. The general will on Kant's mature understanding gives the law by virtue of its form rather than making it by virtue of its matter. And the existence of a just community no longer depends, as with Rousseau, on passions that are both parochial and difficult to sustain, particularly under conditions of modern enlightenment. Instead, equal freedom under law can be secured or at least approached by an appeal to reason, either in a higher moral sense that takes men as they ought to be, or in a lower merely prudential sense that takes them as they are. But in neither case, in Kant's writing prior to the French Revolution, need subjects themselves participate in positive lawmaking, as with Rousseau. It suffices from the standpoint of right that the ruler treat them, quote, in accordance with their dignity, unquote, as potential law-giving members of a moral kingdom of ends. And in keeping with this fact, Kant's description of the perfect republic and the critique of pure reason makes no provision for popular participation in lawmaking. And this is uh, uh, number, selection A on your handout, which for reasons of time I will not, I will not pause to, to read out. Now, Kant, Kant's retort, a retort to Bruckner in this quotation, and implicitly to Machiavelli, advances a Republican idea that combines a Rousseauian end with Hobbesian means. Rulers treat their subjects in accordance with their dignity, not by allowing them a share in equal lawmaking, but instead through the irresistible commands as the, quote, hard shell, unquote, in which the predisposition to think freely can develop to its fullest, and hence the surest way, according to Kant's writings of this period, to promote the moralization of the human race. Three, Kant's politics after the death of Frederick the Great. Two major events whose importance to Kant can hardly be overstated radically changed his treatment of both republicanism and politics, both broadly speaking and as a term of art. The death of Frederick II in 1786 and the storming of the Bastille in the summer of 1789. As a result of these events and their aftermath, in the one case, the ascendance to the throne of a king distinctly hostile to Kant's larger purposes 
On the other, an increasingly radical and violent revolutionary turn in France, along with the accompanying domestic Prussian reaction, Kant found himself forced to address practical political matters more directly and thematically than previously. In so doing, these events also prompted him to revisit his earlier confidence in absolutist monarchy, so long as the ruler did not lack understanding, as the surest practical route to human progress. Accompanying these changes in Kant's external situation was a new insight on his part into the systematic role and purpose of reflective judgment, first fully elaborated in the critique of judgment, the final version of which was completed in the last months of 1789. The accompanying a priori principles of teleological judgment not only lent critical grounding and precision to Kant's previously freestanding historical presumption, quote, that all natural predispositions of a creature are determined sometime to develop themselves completely and purposively, unquote. They also provided new conceptual tools, or so I'll argue, for his emerging understanding of the state as an organized whole, a new term for him. Two issues loom especially large in this redirection of Kant's focus toward a more direct engagement in political affairs, freedom of religion and the purported right of revolution. As to the first, under Frederick the Great, Kant had enjoyed wide latitude to publish what he wished, so much so that he dedicated the critique of pure reason to Frederick's official censor, who was a personal friend. Frederick's successor, Frederick William II, took a different and more restrictive view, especially in matters of religious liberty, to preferring to confine the officially recognized sects to professing their official doctrines and restricting others to near public silence. The impact of the French Revolution was even more far-reaching. The appearance of a German translation in 1791 of Burke's Reflections on the Revolution in France, followed by Rayburg's endorsement of Burke's work in the same year, and the fuller and far more influential translation of Burke's work published by August Gens in 1793, helped set in motion a conservative reaction even prior to the execution of Louis XVI and subsequent terror that seemed to confirm Burke's darkest predictions. That this reaction included um, Kant's uh, sometime, owned Kant sometime followers, such as Gens and Rayburg, must have been a particular blow and culminated in the first instance in Kant's publication of On the Common Saying that this may be true in, that may be true in theory, but is of no use in practice, 1793, which can be read as a direct response to Burke's charge, reaffirmed by Gens and Rayburg, that metaphysics had caused the revolution and which represents Kant's first effort to deal systematically with the question of application, as he puts it. As Rader Maddox has recently argued, Kant in this and subsequent works denies the right of revolution in no uncertain terms while also insisting on an a priori rational principles that duly carried out would uphold civic equality of citizens, including a right in the case of active citizens to participate in positive law giving. In so doing, Kant not only attempts to steer a narrow course between the revolution's more radical German supporters, such as Forster and Fichte, and conservative defenders of traditional institutions, such as Rayburg and Gens, he thereby marks out, through his own public writings, a course of speech and action that is political in a true, as he puts it, sense that Kant explicitly describes for the first time. Section four, Kant's true politics his term, true politics. Kant uses the term politics increase, increasingly in the early 1790s, though still in, in a, keeping its largely Machiavellian flavor. For example, in religious, religion within the boundaries of bare reason, and I'll, I won't give you the, ex, the citations, but I'd be happy to do so. It's only with the, toward eternal peace, the most obviously political and politically influential piece he ever wrote that politics receives more positive coloration, at least potentially, in partial response, perhaps, to Gens's own positive use of the term. It is also here that Kant, for the first time, offers an explicit definition of politics, and indeed not one, but two. Quote, as applied doctrine of right, as Uben de Rexlera, and as the art of making use of nature's mechanism for governing human beings, unquote. In what then does the applied doctrine of right consist? 
and how of it all might include making use of the mechanism of nature to govern human beings. Kant's subsequent account of what he calls the true politics offers an enticing, if ambiguous, answer. And again, I'm going to skip reading the long quotation, B, um, and leave it to you to um, parse for yourself. It's certainly, a, as I say, it's enticing but, but ambiguous. And in this long quotation from um, Perpetual Peace, which I think is relatively well known, politics pays homage, advance homage to morality by bending the knee to right, which it, though it is no um, cross, middle ding, nevertheless combines an act of use, a use that it would seem to, using that it would seem to share with other arts devoted to the manipulation of natural objects, with an act of governing, only possible in the case of objects that are also rational beings. So politics is this, this curious middle thing uh, in which one uses human beings in a way as one uses things, uh, the mechanism of nature, but with a moral end, and then somehow with respect to those very same human beings as, as moral persons. The question is, how is that possible? Kant's later dis comparison in the doctrine of right, of the juridical community of persons to the physical community of bodies, will shed further light on right's peculiar role in mediating between the laws of nature and those of freedom, and hence in cutting the knot that politics for itself cannot unravel. And it may have prompted Kant's attempt in an early draft of that later work to distinguish politics as a science, that is to say, a body of knowledge informed by an idea, from politics understood as a branch of prudence. And here I will read, um, because it's unfamiliar, I will read um, paragraph C. Politics as a science is the system of the laws for securing the rights and satisfaction of the people with their internal and external condition. Just as prudence, klugheit, is the skill of using human beings, free beings, as means to one's aims. So politics, Staatskunst, is that prudence through which someone understands how to use an entire free people for his aims. Now Kant's draft adds a further condition with which a true politics must harmonize namely that all right, laws of right be publicizable. And yet the failure of the published version, either to call politics a science, that's something he never puts in print, or to provide the definitive transcendental principle of public right that Kant had earlier promised at the conclusion of Toward Eternal Peace, but he never actually provides, suggests the impossibility, as he may have come to see it, of any strictly scientific approach to the task to which politics properly addresses itself, namely, to make the public, quote, satisfied with its condition, unquote. Instead, Kant looks to the Republican idea, elaborated along explicitly organic lines, and including for the first time an insistence that citizens actively participate in lawmaking to newly facilitate the transition from a politics that, quote, makes use of the mechanism of nature, unquote, to govern human beings, to one that treats the human being who is now more than a machine, as he had earlier put it, in keeping with his dignity, unquote. Okay, so five, Kant's late republicanism from singular to systematic representation. That new emphasis can already be detected in the critique of judgment which compares the recent transformation of a people into a state to the organization of a direct natural purpose or living organism generally. And this is a paragraph D on the handout. The analogy of a direct natural end, Naturzweck, can shed light on a certain association more encountered in the idea than in reality. Thus, in speaking of the recent total transformation, Umbildung, of a great people into a state, the word organization was often and very aptly made use of for the establishment of magistrates, etc., and even for the entire state body. For each member in such a whole should indeed be not merely a means, but also at the same time an end in cooperating mit Wirken with the, uh, in the possibility of the whole. Um, um, from, um, is on the one hand determined in its place, for each is determined in its place and functioned by the idea of the whole. 
Now, the citizen is here for the first time conceived as actively contributing as member, um, not merely part of the civic body, to actualizing the Republican idea. And Kant expands upon the nature of the civic body, the maternal womb, as he will later put it, from which each has arisen and to which each must leave behind a sacred pledge, in theory and practice, which explicitly connects citizenship for the first time with the right to vote. The rightful civic constitution is based, as Kant now puts it, on three a priori principles, namely freedom, equality, and independence, on abhengigkeit, as the quality necessary to have a, quote, vote in legislation. Independence, in turn, includes, quote, living by alienating what is one's own, but excludes serving others, um, that is, giving them permission to make use of one's faculties or means, vermögen, and it is thus compatible um, for Kant with the role that Frederick the Great at least claimed to occupy, namely of serving no one other than the commonwealth. Now, in keeping with this change, Kant introduces what he calls the representative system, which is roughly based on the one proposed by the abbesiers and subsequently adopted by French lawmakers. Where Kant had earlier left representative of the people, representation of the people in Gotobesian fashion to the actual ruler, head of state, he now carves out an explicit representative role for an elective legislature, albeit one whose relation to positive lawmaking as distinguished from the fundamental law giving by which the Constitution is itself established remains perhaps understandably unspecified. That reticence in an essay written to defend metaphysics against the charge that it had in Rayburg's words caused the revolution is understandable and was in any case in keeping with Kant's ongoing claim that even in the absence of such a legislature, rule in accordance with principles of right was sufficient to infuse the, quote, mechanism, unquote, of coercive laws with, quote, the spirit of freedom, unquote. Such infusion would at least enable citizens, quote, to become rationally convinced that this coercion is in conformity with right, quote, unquote, and thus obey without, quote, falling into contradiction with themselves. At the same time, the hard shell of Kant's pre-revolutionary writings, one that allowed the predisposition to think freely to develop to its maximum extent by reducing external friction to a minimum, um, has been replaced by a, quote, maternal womb, unquote, in which moral education can proceed more organically and through the self-cultivation of a reason freed from the burden of obedience to laws that reason cannot justify. A similar reticence and related emphasis on fusing coercive laws with the spirit of republicanism prevails in toward eternal peace, which treats active citizenship and the accompanying right to vote only indirectly under the rubric of the representative system, but everybody in Kant's audience would have known that the representative system refers to France and Abbesiers, and they would have known that it meant something like that, which can be honored in the spirit by a ruler's way of governing, as when Frederick II at least, quote, said he was only the highest servant of the state, unquote. Indeed, Kant is here still willing to allow that of all forms of sovereignty, monarchy, so long as the ruler governs in that spirit, is the case state constitution that best accords with the, quote, possibility of republicanism, unquote, to which the constitution may hope to be raised by gradual reforms, whereas democracy or rule by all can be thus transformed only by violent revolution. Republican hope thus rests at this point less with aristocracy or with pure democracy than with the monarch whose way of governing accords with the spirit of the representative system, unquote. At the same time as Kant here adds, Without a representative system, quote, every way of governing is despotic and violent, irrespective of the official constitution. In what then does a representative system consist? And does its spirit suffice indefinitely? Or is every way of governing, not in accordance with both the spirit and the letter of a representative system, ultimately despotic and violent? And how radical is Kant, finally? Um, as Kant's last sentence might be taken to imply. Kant's later Metaphysics of Morals, published during the waning days of an increasingly enfeebled monarch, offers the following clarification, and this is E on the handout. Every true republic is and can be nothing other than a representative system of the people in order to procure its rights in the people's name through all state citizens united by means of its delegates. Another allusion 
no doubt, to France. Whereas he had earlier assigned the representative function to the head of state alone as representing the general will of the people, the three persons of the general will are now said to collectively constitute the relation of a general commander to those who obey. So headship now takes a double form, both, both as the relation of command without which a rightful state cannot be thought and is therefore necessary in the idea, and as the delegated headship or executive power in which, by which actual laws are put into effect. And lawgiving similarly assumes a double form, both the sort of ideal Republican legislative form by which the, the you know, the, the basic laws of, of juridical norms are specified, and then an actual legislature by which positive laws are, are put into effect. The nominal subordination of the executive and judicial to the, to the legislative power, a subordination Kant had earlier insisted on in principle, if not in practice, in the, in the Natura Faraben lectures, uh, is now supplemented, in other words, by an effectual share on the citizens' part in the framing of positive laws. Accordingly, the people of Kant's true republic, as he puts it, need, need no longer, don't need a, a single uh, external head of state in order to have con, um, effectual existence, as in Kant's earlier writings. And rather, the united people are or can become the sovereign itself as in the telling case of Louis XVI, who inadvertently wasted, laid waste to, but you know, in a, jock, in a more, I guess, uh, slangy sense, wasted, literally, his own rulership. Um, and this is, um, this is F on the handout. It was thus a great misstep in judgment on the part of a mighty ruler, forgive the typo, of our time when to help himself out of embarrassment of large state debts, he left it to the people to take on this burden and distribute it as it deemed good. For then the law-giving authority naturally came into the people's hands, not only with regard to the taxation of subjects, but also with regard to governing, namely that it not incur new de debts through wastefulness or war, so that the entire power of ruling of the monarchy entirely vanished uh, and passed over to the people to whose law-giving will the mind and mind of each subject was subjected. In other words, the rulership of a wasteful king could vanish or literally be laid waste without the state thereby descending into lawless anarchy as Kant had previously conceived matters because the people, as he now sees it, can be a whole without being represented by an external head of state who wields effectual power as on Kant's earlier, more strictly Hobbesian model. And Kant's unpublished reflections cast further light upon the nature of this sudden constitutional improvement without an accompanying cessation, however temporary, of civic life. And um, rather than uh, read this whole thing out for purposes of time, I'm just going to refer you to G on the handout. And it's a very complex and peculiar set of reflections in which the people, you know, sort of nullify, are called to presence before the monarch and, and, so, and, 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 and no longer merely represented, but are themselves present. And in that process, his own mirror-like reflection of the people disappears. It's a very strange set of metaphors, um, but you know, worth, worth, a, worth a read. Kant's play here on the term Stellen brings home his current dissatisfaction with his own earlier, more strictly Hobbesian account of representation. The people's representative should not take their place in the manner of an external proxy or Stellvertreter, but should instead itself belong to what it represents, as with the people's deputies, once summoned by the then ruling monarch. Um, and it, an added note suggests, moreover, the importance of active citizenship. And here's an additional, and I think sometimes overlooked, but, but really interesting point. Um, in giving substance to, literal substance, to a popular unity that otherwise depends on representation by proxy. And this is H on the handout. The National Assembly was called in order to save the state by covering with their guarantee um, all the debts imposed on the state by the extravagance of the government. They therefore had to freely guarantee it with their property. They had therefore to put themselves in a condition such that they alone could dispose of their property, hence in a condition of freedom, albeit under law, so they could guarantee the debt. 
um, but that those they gave themselves. That is a republic condition or condition of free citizens. And the court had itself yielded the right to encounter them, to encumber them. But so that they could achieve this guarantee, they had to establish a constitution that could exercise no authority or, or violence over them. Kant's implicit assimilation of Bürger and Verbürgen, citizen and to back up or guarantee, draws attention to the sub substantival character of active citizens who guarantee state solvency with their own property and helps explain why, in his final estimation, self-subsistence, Selbstständigkeit, uh, this is the term he uses in the Metaphysics of Morals, replaces independence, Unabhängigkeit, the term he still uses in theory and practice, as the essential characteristic, or one of the three essential characteristics of the active citizen. For while independence is merely the logical negation of dependence, self-subsistence entails, self-stendekite, entails the further positive quality on Kant's later account of being able to manage one's own affairs in reciprocal relation with others. Thus, while the savage may be independent, and in this negative sense, his own master, only one who is capable of sustaining himself or herself, but it's actually himself, collectively without ceasing to be self-directing, uh, counts as self-subsistent in a way that makes one capable of voting or giving voice, stimmgebung, and thereby organizing, organisieren the state in common with others. There's, in other words, where, where, whereas active citizens can be regarded as substances in community with other substances in accordance with the a priori concept of relation, passive citizens, as Kant puts it, quote, lack civic personhood, and as he adds, quote, their existence is, as it were, merely inherence. Unquote. Passive citizens exist in a civic sense, in other words, only insofar as they are maintained by and here in active citizens on whom passive citizens depend for their support, just as properties exist only insofar as they inhere in substances. Now, Kant's comparison of the active citizen to substance metaphysically conceived contrasts revealingly with a similar pre-revolutionary analogy. According to that earlier analogy, all citizens exist merely as inherences in the substance of the state, by which each is maintained and without which none would have a future he or she could count on. And this is I on the handout. Because an individual human being can suffer no other security for his future preferences, he is juridically only accidents, which can only exist in herendo. A civic whole is substance. It seems to be the state alone and not individual citizens on Kant's pre-revolutionary understanding that counts as self-subsistent, capable of existing in reciprocal community, commercium with others. A commercium here identified not with the individual state, as in his later work, but solely with the League of Nations. Thus, according to the same unpublished reflection, and this is Jay, the question is whether the end of humanity is the transformation of substance into accident, i.e. of a federation into a world republic, or whether it is of accident into substance. And the duty of the state toward itself is to preserve itself as a particular state, such that this duty could not be yielded. Um, so um, in the latter case, the unity of commercium, League of Nations, remains the sole thing that constitutes the end of humanity not the unity of adherence, not the unity of dependence of a highest referee, but the freedom of each individual state under in universal laws, autonomy. So this is a question for Kant, apparently in this earlier 1780s period. The restriction of self to the state in these comments shed suggestive light, I think, on Kant's changing conception of the Felkerbund between 1784 and 1795 in accordance with the principle of autonomy as elaborated in the ground laying. Um, to his later non-coercive and more restrictive conception in toward eternal peace of the Federation as a non-coercive union of republics and their like, or what he there calls a federalism of free states. For states as organized beings in their own right have, quote, outgrown um, and vaxen, uh, as he tellingly puts it, the constraint of others. In some revolutionary developments in France, including the distinction between active and passive citizenship, 
introduced by the ABICAs and deputized rule under a representative um, National Assembly, seem to have provided con con convenient conceptual tools for integrating his new understanding of organized being um, within the framework of his long-standing Republican idea. The active citizens of such a state are not just inherent parts, as with citizens as such in Kant's pre-revolutionary understanding, but substantive members organizing or co-affecting Mitwirken to introduce new laws. Um, okay, so in, in um, you know, I would go, go on to, to, to say more about the, or how, how this transformation of, a, of essentially mechanical to an organic conception of the state, um, but I'll pass over that section and maybe just, just conclude um, with the following. Um, that um, in, in the end, Kant... Um, Kant sees the, the French Revolution as a particularly fortuitous moment in history in which a people rich in spirit, um, Geistreich, have, have somehow achieved all at once, in a you know, one fell swoop, a transformative event that he thought would take you know, many, many decades, perhaps many centuries. And he subsequently distinguishes between the spirit-rich people um, the French for sure, maybe the other European peoples, and then the somewhat less spirit-rich uh, people in other continents, you know, may take them a little while longer before they achieve a similar transformation. And as a result, he has a kind of two-tiered suggestion that, you know, republicanism rise away for some and, and more gradually for others. Um, 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 and, and more recent self-styled Kantians um, have understandably abandoned the racial anthropology that supports this graduated Republican model without giving up, I think, its implicit distinction between what people will and what they ought to will. Indeed, it may be one of the ongoing um, and lingering in ironies of Kant's late works to have helped unleash through the vigor and eloquence of their argument not only the worldwide movements of the last two centuries in support of representative popular government, but also in the latter's name for that rule by an enlightened liberal elite in accordance with what a rational people should want that may have helped to provoke, however inadvertently, the current anti-liberal populist backlash. At the same time, Kant's anticipation, the anticipation of Kant's, early, in Kant's earliest moral and political writings of that graduated civil model suggests that it's fundamentally rooted neither in autonomy or, um, uh, um, or uh, emerging critical system, nor in his reaction to external events of the late 1780s and 90s, but rather in a more long-standing effort on his part to address a problem to which he had been initially awakened through his reading of Rousseau, that of reconciling the competing claims of freedom, understood as subjection to no law one does not also give, and modern scientific progress. And Pro Professor Hanna, I think, gave us a, a nice exposition of where that tension might be situated today. Whether Kant's late works offer a definitive response to Rousseauian pessimism on this score remains an open question. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Schell. I have to ask you, Nina, how many time do we have? 50 minutes, and you call up the restaurant. OK. Now we have 15 minutes for discussion. Please give your comments or uh, questions. Thank you. Yeah, is that working? Yeah. Uh, thanks for the presentation. The, the, my question, I think it, it's just to try and, and get some clarity on the specific use that Kant is making of the term substance. 
Uh, so I'm, I'm thinking Sovereign? Of Is sub that the substance. Substance. Oh, sorry, yeah. So, so in, in uh, what is it, I, right, uh, in, in your handout, uh, Kant speaks of the civic hall as a substance. And, uh, you know, Brian Hall, who has recently written a book on the Opus Postumum, uh, sort of <laughs> tracks Kant's shifting use of the word substance from, say, the way in which he understands it in the first critique, where substance and inherence is a hyper-technical term, right? It's referring to a pure concept of the understanding to whatever is happening in the 90s. Uh, so, so yeah, I suppose my, my question would be, what, what exactly does Kant have in mind here? Because obviously he's not talking about a pure concept of the understanding <laughs> when he calls the civic hall a substance, or, or, or is he? Well, I guess my somewhat you know, perverse reading of the metaphysics of morals, but this would take a long argument, is that there's a very powerful analogy that he makes right at the beginning. Um, and he, so that, that the forms of the Rex Lara is, is still drawing on this older, you know, this cate the category of substance in, in a sense that, had, that he had been using for, you know, for, 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 for many years. Um, of course, that's a very complicated, what kind of analogy, what, is the, what are the implications of the analogy, but the analogy is very, very clear and literal, and it comes out again not just in the introduction to the, to the, the Rex Lehrer, but also when he talks about active citizenship. And he, you know, he, he, he compares passive citizens to inherences in substance. And um, so he, he himself is making, you know, somehow drawing on this analogy to, to give a kind of formal clarity to what, what he thinks, how you can, I, I guess the, the attractive idea is that you can somehow reconcile individuality in a, in, a, in a kind of integral sense with unity, with, you know, that the idea of community as a kind of reciprocal interdependence through law, which unlike the laws of nature are self-generated or self-enacted, um, gives a kind of, um, a kind of renders intelligible, uniquely intelligible a kind of metaphysical community, which on theoretical grounds is not intel is not fully explicable. Um, so it's a and this is a this is a kind of analogy that runs you know runs through Kant's you know he's always a kind of experimenting with that idea. I mean that you could say the kingdom of ends is another is another version of this this idea of and you know some of the some of the reflections also sort of bear out that he, when he says that you can't make fully intelligible the idea of commercium in a metaphysical sense, other than practically and morally. So I would take this to be another exemplification of that, of that thought process. But how it, you know, how it translates politically uh, in, more, in, in, a, in, a, in a more concrete sense would, would take, would take a, a longer argument. But yeah, thank you for the question. And it's, it's interesting that yes, he is at the same time experimenting in the opus posthumum with maybe a different theoretical formulation of substance, but he's practically speaking, he still seems to be intrigued with this way in which it resolves a kind of conceptual difficulty of, of a strong individualism and a strong communitarianism yoked together so that they are inseparable. Um, my question is about um, your comments on Rousseau, and I'm wondering in particular about um, what you think about the observations uh, the American to the observations, so both of those texts, where it looks like the first, although it might be influenced by Rousseau, the observation, um, it's still um, much more positive about what the arts and sciences can do. I'm thinking of the, the, the ending on, on palingenesis. But then the American look like they're even more influenced by Rousseau. And I was just curious um, why, why you kind of read him as, um, uh, if I understood you correctly, kind of rejecting Rousseau, or not completely agreeing, uh, agreeing with him. Well, I think he's, yeah. he, he's at least troubled by the thought that the only way you can have civic freedom is by, in a way, giving up science and giving up enlightenment and returning to something like, um, you know, uh, passion-rooted, um, 
homogeneous, small republics. Um, so this is not an attra this is the one part of Rousseau I think that, that Kant never finds fully attractive. And he seems to be struggling throughout the, the, um, the Bemerkingen with a way to, uh, you know, to sort of square that circle. And, and one idea he has, uh, because I mean, the other odd thing about the Bemerkingen is that he doesn't really use, have a kind of progressive idea of history quite yet. He has a kind of cir circular idea of history, which is a little bit like this phoenix-like expansion and contraction that he makes use of metaphorically in the um, universal theory of the heavens. Um, so that it's, he says that there, you, know, you have science and then you have enlightenment and then somehow enlightenment sort of tips the balance and then you kind of revert to this more, the simpler social existence of Republican virtue. But he's, he's clearly experimenting with different possibilities there. But I don't think he ever, he he's always wants to be more optimistic than I think Rousseau read <laughs> straightforwardly is about the possibility of reconciling um, uh, you know, it, the advances of the arts and sciences and, um, and, and individual virtue. Um, that's true that Emile, which is the work that Kant most, I think, studies and is most affected by, does suggest a somewhat more optimistic uh, possibility, at least for individuals, that you could be part of an enlightened community and, and yet still, like Emile himself, be a natural, and, and, a natural man and a citizen at the same time. But it's a, it's a somewhat tentative um, experiment for Rousseau and one that, e that even in the American again, uh, Kant says, gee, you know, Emile was great. It's too bad Kant didn't show you you could set up schools <laughs> so everybody could be you know, taught like this. But, you know, what a waste to have one guy teach one kid. You know, what a waste of one guy's talent. You know, so he's already kind of you know, chomping at the bit. There, you know, he's inspired by Rousseau but also dissatisfied, I would say. Mm -hmm. Thank you. No questions at all. Uh, how about? Uh, I, I, I was just uh, inspired by these remarks on Kant completely uh, adopted. Uh, Rousseau's uh, theory of the general will as the only possible uh, lawgiver for any kind of republic. Rousseau's book was uh, appeared in, in uh, 1762. It was burnt both in Paris uh, by the Parliament and and in and in Geneva. <laughs> yes, uh, this. Uh, uh, cover page, uh, Citoyen de Genève. Uh, so this was a highly controversial uh, 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 book. I mean, this was a revolutionary book. The uh, uh, Jacobins carried it through the cities of Paris. Uh, so uh, Kant <laughs> never uh, gave up this uh, uh, only rational foundation of, of, of uh, securing the uh, rights of people, namely through uh, laws where the uh, subjects of the law are also the law givers. I mean, this, is a, this is the eternal norm. I quoted this in, in my paper. Uh, from, this is uh, 98, when most of the, uh, the, the German uh, um, intellectuals who had had a favorable view, a view on the French Revolution, had parted company with, with the, the French Revolution. I mean, most of them were Girondists and not, not Jacobins. Okay, uh, what I want to say is we know <coughs> from Abeg and, and other sources that can never uh, distance himself from the French Revolution, even after the <laughs> I mean, he, there are passages where he criticizes the Tilloir. But he, he, he never, uh, well, he, he, he gave his explanation. Of course, there is no right to revolution. But this is a physical event. This is a part of no, natural No, I don't history. disagree with any of that. Yeah, yes, and so uh, uh, we, we, we should uh, assess it as the voice of nature <laughs> calling. Yes, no, I totally agree with that. that so, yeah. uh, so, I mean, uh, the, the 
there is a, a tendency in, in, the, in the German uh, uh, criticism of, of Kant's relation to Rousseau, which makes an, a, uh, is based on a premise which is, in my view, incorrect. The Contrat Social is the only work of uh, philosophical, uh, philosophical value of uh, Rousseau. He, he admires, and of course, the Professor Don Bicker Savoyard, this is also a very powerful influence on Kant and so forth. And the Emile, that's why, why he, he got uh, out of the rails of his daily, uh, daily uh, life. Uh, so, uh, yes, there was a, and Rousseau had me to recht and so forth. Uh, there are socialist uh, leanings there in these reflections of, from the 60s. Uh, yes, so, uh, but, but uh, what counts philosophically is that the only possible um, security for the rights of humans is the state, the republic. Uh, based on the general will. And this is something that Kant openly took over from, from, from Rousseau and never abandoned. So uh, everything, uh, everything else seems to be marked. Well, this is, a, I mean, this is a very, I mean, I, I, mean, I, I agree with 90% of what you say. And yes, of course, and, and particularly the, the French revolutionary moderates he, he, he supported um, without, without question, although he had to be somewhat careful about how he expressed his support. But I would, I would have to disagree with your interpretation of his appropriation of Rousseau. I mean, I think, and again, this would be a much longer argument. If you take literally the social contract, the social contract only works in a small, homogeneous republic where people are fundamentally um, kind of emotionally attached to one another through the rhetorical powers of a great legislator who is a quasi-religious figure who does not himself rule, but is a kind of poet legislator who inspires the people with a kind of enthusiastic identification with the community. And that is never, I think, an I mean, I think Kant saw the, the virtues of that in that it makes possible, and this is in his very early reception of Rousseau, a kind of identification with, with the whole and with virtue that, that, that is, is attractive in some ways, but in other ways, it's not rational. And the one thing that, so there is a, a precy of the social contract at the end of a meal, and I think that's the, that's the social contract that, Rousseau, that, that, that Kant really takes to heart. And that's a, that's a version of the social contract that Emile, the enlightened nat, natural man, uh, is given. Uh, it doesn't have anything about civil religion, and it doesn't have anything about uh, a peculiar parochial civil religion. It doesn't have anything about a great legislator. So I think what, it, and it is based on a kind of ra appropriation of the rational norms spelled out in the, in the social contract. But in the actual social contract, if you, if you read it carefully, the actual citizens of Sparta, Geneva, and so on, can't themselves, in a way, read the social contract. And, and because, because the, the foundations of the social contract, the rational foundations, are ultimately based on a kind of individual self-interest. You know, this is the way you preserve your liberty. But the, the psychology of a citizen is a denatured psychology, as Kant puts it at the beginning of Emile, uh, as Rousseau puts it, uh, which is in a, some, in, in a funny way in tension with, with reason itself. So what Kant wants to do is to have virtue based on reason. And I think that's something, the possibility of which Rousseau doesn't really fully acknowledge. Now this is a huge argument in the Rousseau scholarship and I can't just, you know, I could state it here dogmatically. One would have to have a very long conversation. But I've spent a lot of my career trying to figure out what what, what moved Kant to appropriate Rousseau as he did, what he took, what he, what he found imperfect. And what at least I've found in the you know, kind of careful textual study is that there is a certain lingering attraction to a certain Hobbesian element of political thought that 
hangs around in Kant until the French Revolution. And that was what I was trying to document. This obviously is a much longer conversation, and I, I very much appreciate your point, and I take it to heart. And I, fundamentally, you know, Rousseau was Kant's guy. I don't, I don't deny that. But the complexities of enacting it politically and reconciling it with transcendental philosophy are, are enormous. And, and that we, again, it would take a much longer conversation than, unfortunately, we have time for here. But thank you for the excellent question. Thank you also. I think that must be our last word. I thank you very much. And I'm very hopeful that we can meet us together in 2024. In good health. Yes, thank you to everyone. You've been a wonderful conference.